I would like to present our presenter, Cameron McNeil. Cam is uh, from Staff Corp. He's been there for 25 years. Uh, during his career, he's held positions in sales, tech support, and product management. He spent much of his career providing technical guidance to system design or systems design and to maintenance engineers in the area of hydraulic filtration and matching the fluid cleanliness levels to the machine requirements. Cam is currently the global product manager for filtration at Stoff. And without further ado. Uh, good afternoon. So the, the title is, is how do you limit or control contaminants in a hydraulic system? Well, in a, in a nutshell is you got to have a plan. And today what we're going to uh, present or to show it are some of the parameters that you need to look at or you should be looking at when you're trying to formulate a plan. So what we'll do is we'll have a brief introduction. We'll talk about what kind of contamination types, what are we talking about when we're, when we're talking about a, a limiting or filtering or cleaning contaminants, uh, how they get into a system. Uh, then we'll talk about the damage that these contaminants have on your hydraulic system and your machine itself. Uh, then we'll get into fluid cleanliness levels. That's the chapter of how do we express clean versus dirty. Uh, target cleanliness levels. That's really the, the work, the workbook, uh, part of the presentation. And this is where we can match the target cleanliness level to the piece of equipment and how it's being used. Uh, then we'll talk about um, contamination control bases or the filter as a tool to limit contamination, filter efficiency and how do you compare different filters. And then we'll, we'll finish up with monitoring or how do we, how do we test our system to know that we've been uh, productive or successful. So why do we want to have a a control plan or a contamination control plan to begin with. Well, contaminants reduce system life. Um, so what is, what is it that a, a contamination control plan produce? A contamination control plan, uh, it provides cleanliness, which improves reliability and efficiency in a hydraulic system. How can cleanliness be achieved? Well, filtration and filters are the tools that we use to clean uh, our hydraulic fluid. And how can we verify our success or failures? Well, monitoring or testing of the fluid is a tool we use to figure whether our plan has been successful or our actions have been successful or not. And then what designs are best? When you're looking at controlling contamination in a hydraulic system, it's the, it's the best designs in the filter and matching it to your overall goal that's important. So that's why a plan is needed in order to um, carry out or improve cleanliness. So it's, it's something you hear a lot in, in the hydraulic field that 90% of hydraulic system failures can be attributed to some kind of contamination. And uh, way back, beginning of my career, I, I did a lot of, spent a lot of time repairing hydraulic pumps and motors. And I can tell you at that point, it was probably 100% of all the failures we looked at were attributed somehow to some contamination. So it's really important that we find a way to limit this contamination in our hydraulic system. So, contamination types and sources. So the first thing that you're going to see coming through, especially when we're talking about solid particulate contamination, is we're, you're going to hear us talk about um, microns. You know, what's a micron? A micron is a, a millionth of a meter. So it's a really, really small particle. And we'll get some relative size to that later on. But that's that. That's the symbol when you see it in the in the presentation. Uh, that means micron. So, how do contaminants? What are contaminants, and how do they get in the system? 
Okay. When we, when we talk about contaminants, we have to think a little bit more than just solid particulate, you know, dirt or, or wear metals. You know, they can be, it can be fluids. It can be other things. But how does it get into the system? In general terms, uh, contaminants get into a system in, in a number of different ways. One of them is inbuilt. Okay. Those are the contaminants that are left over in the hydraulic system from the actions of building the hydraulic system. So you can have weld slag from welding on tanks or welding on pipes. You can have grind dust that's left in a reservoir that's not cleaned out. You can have sandwich bags in a reservoir that were left in. But anything, anything that you can think of that can be left in a hydraulic system that wasn't flushed out properly um, during its construction, that's inbuilt contaminants. These are generally larger contaminants and really quite easy to filter or to get out of the system. The next one we're looking at is ingress contaminants. So these are the contaminants or the dirt or the substance that comes into a hydraulic system during the action of a hydraulic system. So you, a, a lot of systems have breathers. So any kind of contaminants that can come in with air in a reservoir can be pulled in. Those are ingressed. A lot of, um, uh, of machines have cylinders. So the cylinder goes out. Uh, dirt or debris gets on the on the cylinder shaft. You pull it back in, it gets by the scraper. Those are are ingress contaminants. And again, those are relatively large, and thereby uh, somewhat easy to filter out of your system. The next ones are generated contaminants. Now these are the wear products of the movement of different surfaces against each other in a hydraulic system, whether it's a pump, motor, valves. Now, these contaminants can be very small. They can be, you know, smaller than three micron. Um, these are also can be created under extreme pressure and high temperatures, which makes them very, very hard. And these are the contaminants that I say make other contaminants or accelerate the wear process in, in a, in a system. So when we're looking at contaminants, we have to be looking at, at, at uh, a plan or how are we going to limit the ingression, get rid of the stuff that was, that was left over from the building of the system, and at the same time be able to filter out the really small particles that are generated nor, during the, the normal working of our system. The other thing to keep in mind is that when we're talking about contaminants, we're not only talking about solid particles, we're talking about liquids, okay? The, the number one liquid that damages the hydraulic system we would think of as water, okay? Water from condensation, you know, humid air gets into a reservoir through a breather you sh on, in that during the day when you're running the machine at night, you shut it down, uh, the condenses water vapor, condenses the droplets and gets into the hydraulic system. And over time, that can build up. But let's keep in mind that, that liquids could also be other hydraulic fluids. So when you're coming up with a plan, you also have to look at, do we have a process within our plant or with our machines that the proper fluids are going in the proper reservoirs? You know, if you have a, a hydraulic um, reservoir and you put lubrication fluid in it, then it, it's going to mess up the, the hydraulic fluid. Your pumps aren't going to like it. Your cylinders aren't going to like it. And even more... You know, in some industries like steel mills where they use water glycol uh, type fluid, water-based fluid, if you dump, you know, petroleum-based hydraulic fluid into water glycol, you get a jello-like substance that clogs all the filters and can really damage pumps. So we're looking at, at liquids also. And in some cases, we can always look, we can also look at air as being a contaminant. If it's, if it's not a contaminant, it certainly is something that damages uh, the components in a hydraulic system. You know, air molecules and water molecules do not have the same load-bearing characteristics as, as flu uh, hydraulic fluids and lubrication fluids have. And what happens is under, under extreme pressure, those molecules implode, and it causes um, high temperatures, and these little mini implosions can really damage your hydraulic fluid. So we're looking at, at, at having... Uh, air being limited, so no aeration of the tank 
and a good way for air to, to release out of the hydraulic fluid in the, in the uh, reservoir and allow that to go away. So as we go along, we're going to talk a lot about solid contaminants, but keep in mind that we're looking at things that are, that are quite large to quite small, and we're also looking at limiting wear metals, solid contaminants, liquids, and air. Okay. Now, why are we trying to keep that stuff out of our system? Okay, so what kind of damage is caused when these contaminants get in the hydraulic system? Well, you can have things like uh, orifice blockage, um, component wear, you know, the mechanisms of wear within a hydraulic system, uh, formation of rust or oxidation, or, or actually the oxidation of the, of the fluid itself. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I do training presentations in smaller groups and and I ask, you know, what what is the most important component in a hydraulic system? You know, and you hear a lot of people put their hand up and they'll say it's the pump or it's the motor or it's the servo valve or whatever. And then I make a case for it's the hydraulic fluid. The hydraulic fluid is is the only thing that touches everything else in the system. And... We don't always look at hydraulic fluid as a component of the system. It's just something that we put in there to make it work. So, so that we have to be careful of. Um, chemical compound formation or, or acid buildup in fluids and then depletion of additives, how it degrades the life of the hydraulic fluid, which costs us much more money to operate the system. And then in some cases, depending on the, on what kind of fluid we're looking at, if we're looking at cutting oil, water-based fluid, then we can actually have biological growth or uh, in a system that can make people sick. So orifice blockage. I mean, this is really easy to picture. Um, if you have uh, different pumps, servo valves, um, sensor lines, you have very, very small orifices. They could be, you know, 5, 6, 10 micron. And you get a, a, a piece of debris that gets stuck in one of those and plugs it up and the valve doesn't work anymore. Okay. That's one way that contaminants can hurt the system. The next one is wear, you know, wear in a system. And, and there's different kinds of wear in a hydraulic component. You know, there, there's abrasive wear, erosive wear, adhesive wear, and then fatigue. So, what are these? Okay. Abrasive wear is where you have two moving surfaces um, riding on a lubrication uh, um, film, and particles can get into that, that clearance and act like a cutting tool and chip away and scratch things. And, and when this happens, like in a bearing, you know, a bearing might have a, a clearance of, you know, one to three microns or so. Um, you know, it's not the 25 micron, the larger particles that cause a problem in here because they can't get in that clearance. They bounce off and get flushed away. It's the really small particles that can really do damage to, to where the, the, the small clearances are. And we have erosive wear. You know, in, in a lot of hydraulic components on flow control valves, pressure control valves, um, and such, there, there's, there's a lot of sharp edges and such on orifice. And there's a high velocity of fluid as it goes by there. Now, the, if the fluid is dirty, okay, then it kind of acts like a, a sandblaster that's kind of beaten away at those edges. And it can actually take, take the sharp edges and it can take contaminants out of the, out of the, uh, the, the, the body or the, or the orifice and, and flush them downstream. The next one is adhesive wear. Now, adhesive wear, what happens if you have two moving surfaces again, uh, riding on a, on a lubrication film, and under a load, if the fluid is not in good shape, that actual lubrication uh, film or the lubrication 
uh, fluid itself will break down and allow both of those surfaces to, to touch each other while they're moving under extreme loads. So there's a lot of friction in there. So you get a process where they're almost like cold welded together. And when those are ripped apart because of the moving surface, the horsepower pulls it apart, it'll actually pull particles off of both surfaces. Okay? And that's adhesive wear. Fatigue wear is over time, because of loads and pressures, you start to get fissions or little ripples in, in surfaces. And over time, you'll get cracks. And contaminants get forced down into those cracks and, and act as wedges that kind of chip away at the surface to make it rough and to pull away particles and send them downstream. So what are the effects of, of wear? Well, we have dimensional changes, dimensional changes and, and dimensional or clearance changes within, within the components, which lowers the efficiency, which increases the leakage and lowers the efficiency of the system. And even the worst, to, even worse than that to me is that the small particles that are generated accelerate the wear process. So it's like a, a snowball on the top of the hill. It starts small and you roll it down, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So those little wear particles that make other particles can really cause damage and accelerate the wear process in the system. The next thing we have to look at is corrosive wear. Um, this can be very aggressive. Uh, when you When you look at a fluid, and you look all the way over the chart to the right, there's, they're called the total acid number or the TAN number in a, in a fluid test. What that TAN number is, it's a, the change in that is a good indication of the overall health of your fluid. Okay. And what it is, if, if the TAN number changes from a new fluid to the one you're testing in a machine, when it starts to change over 0.5, I mean, that's when your, your antenna has to start to go up to take a look at, at maybe something's going on with the system. And what this chart is showing is that if you don't have any wear metals or catalysts and you have no water in your system, then what they're saying in this fluid would be able to, uh, its life would be 3,500 hours or plus in their operating. Now, when you add water to the system, okay, so you see it changes the TAN number by more than that 0.5, but it still takes a long time for that, that fluid to be damaged. And then you look at, at line number three, where you add iron or ferrous metal um, with no water. Again, you get a change in the chemistry or change in the acid buildup, but it doesn't happen very fast. And then in, in line number four, where you have both water and iron, you look at, at the tan number changing dramatically and you look and you see that after four or five hundred hours of operation, your fluid is, is really damaged. And that's the same thing when we look at copper and water. And copper and brass and such are, are, are integral parts to different components that we have in our hydraulic system. So that's why when we're looking at contaminants, it's not just taking the ferrous metals out. It's try to limit the other water in there because the combination of the two of them are really accelerating the damage to the hydraulic fluid. And again, as I said, could be said to be the most important component in your hydraulic system. The other thing, the other component or byproduct of this is, is the formation of, of rust or, or other kind of oxides in the fluid itself. And as I said before, water doesn't have the same load-bearing characteristics as hydraulic fluid. So if you get water bubbles, free water in your fluid, you can, you can have some problems. This is a, a chart, a study that was done by Bearing Company. And, you know, the whole adage of being in high school and probably heard it from, I used to hear it from my mom, you know, oil and water doesn't mix. Well, the truth is oil and water doesn't mix well. But if you were to look at a standard, you know, off run of the mill, uh, hydraulic fluid or, or lubrication fluid, they can dissolve a certain amount of water in, in that, uh, fluid without causing a problem. 
And that number, it, it varies from different fluids, but 500 ppm is a good number to think about. So 500 ppm is 0.05%. So if you have a fluid where you have, you have a ppm or 100, 200 ppm of, of water dissolved within that fluid, the water is actually dissolving, thereby not really causing a big problem to your hydraulic components. Once you get over that saturation point, that's where you start getting free water or water bubbles in the fluid, and that's where you can cause a, a really big problem. And as you see in this chart, if you look down around the bottom, right around where that 50 is, where, where it really starts to take off and, and have a problem, that's your 500 ppm. And what's, what's interesting is that if you, if you look at, at some, uh, fluid samples, um, the reports come back and when you look at water percentage, they say less than 1%. Or some of them say less than, you know, 0.1%. And what, what this tells us is that once you water level gets to 1%, you, you, you haven't lost the battle, you've lost the war. So if you're putting together your monitoring system, you know, do you have a way of monitoring uh, your water down below 0.05%? Because you would like to look at it and say, hey, my water contents, let's say, uh, you know, 100 ppm. If it starts to rise to 200, you look at it. When it gets around 300, you have to figure out where it's coming from and how you can can make a change before you get to that 500, 600, 700, where you really start to accelerate the issue. The other thing is we talked about, you get a chemical chain reaction that, that happens within the fluid. These acids change, uh, they, they change the molecular structure of your hydraulic fluid. So you're changing its parameters and its ability to work because you're changing how it was, de how it was designed. And one of the big things that, that, that hits first is you lose your additives. Now, the additives in, in hydraulic and lubrication fluids are there for, for a reason. You know, they're, they're there for viscosity stability over temperature range, right? They're there to provide lubricity. Um, there's, there's anti-erosion. Um, there's a whole bunch of different additives that can be put into a hydraulic fluid or a lubrication fluid depending on its design and what it's used for. And what happens is, is that these contaminants start to use up some of these additives. The additives have to, have to be used up and work in order to keep that fluid stable. Once the additives are fully depleted, then you can see the, the, the degradation of the, of the, of the hydraulic fluid goes very quick. Microbes are, or living organisms in fluid. Um, this is primarily when you have a, a water-based fluid, like a, a cutting oil, coolants, um, so water glycols, and typically they're they're being pumped around a system. So you have a reservoir that's warmer than the atmosphere. You have water being splashed around and lots of oxygen. So basically, what you have is an incubator. And if if the fluid gets degraded to the point where you can start getting getting things growing in there, um, it can it can really cause a problem very quickly because these microbes will will grow and reproduce very quick. And what happens is you'll get a um, it's a it's a residue, it almost looks like a sediment in the oil that that clogs up all your valves, clogs up your filters very quickly. Uh, it, it's it's really nasty stuff. Um, how you can tell you know, this is a sour smell, and for anybody who's ever opened up a reservoir that, that's been damaged this way, it, it's not just sour. It, it's a real nasty smell that you don't forget real quick. Um, your oil viscosity gets really thick, and thereby your pressure drops and all your components go up. Uh, your elements clog very quickly, and your fluid, your fluid life is not only reduced, it, it's, it's depleted. So what's this, what's the summary? Well, the summary is that, is that the, the reason why we need a plan is because the energy and the growth 
and the removal of contaminants is a dynamic thing. It can change. Okay, it's not something where you, where your, your uh, system is dirty, you buy a filter, you put it in a system, you walk away from it, and, and think that your success is going to be 100%. You know, over the life expectancy of that piece of equipment, you know, the filtration needs may change somewhat, not a lot, but somewhat. And, and it's, but it's a dynamic thing. So monitoring, trending, and coming up with a plan is really important in order to stay ahead of it. Okay, fluid cleanliness levels. How do we express clean from dirty, or how do we express the, express the cleanliness level of the system? Before we do that, you have to look at the relative size of, of some, some particles, okay? So we talked about the micron. So uh, one grain of salt is around 100 micron. Um, human hair, diameter is around 70. Uh, the limit of vision, let's say, is around 40 micron. Mine's probably a lot higher than that. But, you know, if you take a, a pencil, sharp pencil, and just a little dot in a white piece of paper, that's, that's about 40 micron. And for, for those of you out there who remember, uh, TVs that had a tube on them, and when you shut them off, you had those little pieces of dust that were on there that you could see. Those are about 40 micron, the limit of what you can see. Okay, 25 micron is a, you know, one grain of processed flour. And then, and then you're looking at, at, um, different blood cells and viruses and stuff. You're looking at two micron and below. So when we're looking at cleanliness of a hydraulic fluid, okay, if you look up there, 25 micron and 40 micron are boulders, okay? In the, in the efficiencies and the clearances in today's high performance hydraulic equipment, you know, we're filtering in the, you know, three micron, four micron range, okay? You can't see it, okay? The air we're breathing has more contaminants in it than we want in a hydraulic system. Okay. And in some cases, if you're looking at really sophisticated hydraulic systems, when you're looking at like flight simulators and such, you know, they may want the hydraulic fluid to be, their goal might be to be cleaner than the blood that's flowing through your veins. So we're looking at really small stuff. Okay. Okay. History lesson. You know, why do we go back to 1999? Well, it used to be, it was a test dust that was used to calibrate particle counters and other pieces of equipment, okay? And there was a change in, in the production of that. So they moved from a, a, a pretty much a natural product to a man-made product, which is much more uh, accurate and such. And it changed some specifications, but the most important thing for us in, in our conversation is they changed the label that we put on a particle when it comes to the size in relationship to its size. So, you know, back prior to 1999, the only way that you could, or I guess back even farther in the 60s when they created the, the um, specification, the only way you could measure a particle was look down a microscope against a scale. So you're looking at a particle on one plane, and they were looking at the longest length of that particle, right? And that longest length became the label that they would use in order for a particle. So if you look at that particle that's up there, it's hard to see, but it's like 78 point, I think it's 78.5 um, micron squared is the area. But the longest length is 13 microns. So the old way they do it is they measure it's 13 micron. That's called a 13 micron particle. Now you could cut that thing in half and it's still a 13 micron particle because that's the longest distance. Okay. The new way of doing it, because we have, you know, online particle counters and particle monitors, we can very quickly, as that particle goes down the line, is we can very quickly measure and report what the area is of that particle. Okay, so then we look at it, we take that area, and then they do a quick calculation of what's the diameter of a circle 
that would have the same area as that particle. So the first time I read that, my head spun around once, and I'm like, why do I really need to know? Well, the big thing to know is that when you're looking at, now we're looking at particle sizes, and our next step will be go to target cleanliness levels and then the filtration, we realize that a 13 micron particle that we used to call it is now we're going to call it a 10 micron particle. Okay? The particle hasn't changed size. We've just put a different label on it. Now, how do we know which way it was done? Well, you'll get a 13 micron versus a 10 micron sub C. So whenever you see that little sub C, we know we're expressing a, a particle size that's a relationship to its area. What do you really need to know is that you really can't compare the two. They're different. How different are they? Okay, well, the old 2 is now a 4.2. The old 5 is now a 6.4. And the old 15 is a 13.6. Okay, and if you look right in the chart in the middle, right around the old 10 is now a 9.8. Is that, is that, um, in the smaller sizes, the old one's smaller than the, than the new. And in the larger sizes, it's the other way around. So it's still a little bit confusing. But the thing is to remember, if you're looking at a, at a, at the UM or the mu M side with a C versus not a C, is that they are different. Okay. Now, why is that important? Well, when you look at a filter, and how it's manufactured. And what we're looking up here is beta ratios. We'll get into those a little bit more, but the beta ratio is, is how we express the efficiency of a fluid, right? And it's always expressed at a micron rating. So this just happens to be a filter media. And when we looked at it the old way, okay, this filter media had a beta 3 of 200, okay? With the new specification, the 11171, that is now a 4 micron media sub C at a beta 200. And at a beta 1000, it's a 4.5 micron sub C. Okay? So it used to be a beta 200 of 3. Now it's a beta 200 of 4. But it's also a beta 1000 of 4.5. The media hasn't changed. Okay? So when people are talking about beta, we'll talk about beta ratios very quickly later. But when people talk, do you have a beta 1000 um, media? Well, everybody has beta 1000 media. It's just a different way of expressing its efficiency. Okay, it's not the beta X of 1000 that matters. It's the beta, what's the micron rating? Does it have a sub C? And then the 1000 versus the other one out there when you're trying to compare them, okay? So, and the other thing to keep in mind is, is, is as a filter manufacturer, we can quote these different numbers. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we've changed the media and made it any better at taking contaminants out of the system. Okay. Cleanliness codes. There's three major, um, ways that we express cleanliness in a hydraulic fluid. The, the first one is, is the ISO cleanliness code, ISO 4406. That's the most common. The next one is the NAS code or NAS code. Very common in military, and also they still use a tremendous amount of it in oil and gas industry. Okay. And then the last one is the AS4059, or the ISO 11128. That's an upgrade to the old NAS code. Okay, so what are we, what are we talking about? Okay. First of all, ISO 4406 would look something like this. Okay. Now this says 1916-5. For, for people who, who, who look at ISO codes, this, the, the last five isn't a real number. Okay. And it's there for a reason to make it fit with the presentation, but, that would be like a 1916-13 or something like that in the real world. But just go with me on this. But what do we see there? Okay, that's the old ISO code. Okay. Now, what, what that was done prior to 1987 is that we were counting particles. 
The first number was a was a was a number that was a relationship to greater than two micron. The next one is a relationship of 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 contaminants that are larger than five micron. And the last one were the larger particles greater than 15 micron. Now, why does that matter? Is that to the new code, it's greater than four micron sub C, greater than six micron sub C, and greater than 14 micron sub C. And if you remember the chart that we had here, okay, it's, it's not, it's not out of uh, coincidence that, that they did this. Okay, so now they're looking at the 4, 6, and 14. So that a cleanliness code that was derived 20 years ago is still the same cleanliness code that you can use today. Some of the stuff in the back has changed, but the cleanliness code hasn't changed. Okay? So what does this number mean? Okay, you take a fluid sample, you count the particles, the cumulative, uh, the cumulative counts of the greater than 4, 6, and 14. You count the particles and you put it on a chart. So in this one, it was between 2,500 and 5,000 uh, particles per, per milliliter. It gives you the code of 19. So that's where the first number is. Then you do the next one, which is greater than 6 micron. And in this case, it's it's um, 320 to 420, which gives you code 16. And then the last one is we count the ones that are 14 more. And this is 0.16 to 0.32. How do you get 0.16? Well, we're you know you're taking a fluid sample, you're you're counting hundreds of milliliters of fluid, okay? And some of these charts will be per hundred milliliters, per milliliter, per whatever, okay? And that gives you the code five. So that is your ISO code. You have small particles, medium size, small particles, medium size, and then your high channel. So what are the things that have to happen? Well, the first number has to be the largest because it includes all of them. The next one includes the 6 and the 14 and then the 14 itself. So if you ever see somebody give you ISO code and those numbers aren't flat way, which I have seen printed in some specifications, you know it's not a valid um, uh, cleanliness code. The other thing to keep in mind when you look at the chart is that every time you go up or down a number, you're doubling the amount of contaminants in the sample. Okay? So if you, uh, if you, if you are running at a code 18, for example, okay, and you go down to 16, you've taken you know, you've taken half of the contaminants out, and then you've taken half out again. So one ISO code is a big difference. Two ISO codes is a huge difference. Okay, so it's exponential. So when you look at a, you look at a system and you say, hey, I'm running at 19, 16, 13, and the recommendation is a 17, 14, 12, okay, you, you have double and double again. You have four times the contaminants in the system than what your, your specification recommends. Okay, big numbers. Okay, NAS codes. I typically don't spend a lot of time on NAS codes unless there there are military or or um, uh, oil and gas people in the room. But the NAS code sixteen thirty eight is the old aerospace code. Okay, and if you look at their chart, it's a little bit different. You're not counting greater than five. You're actually counting within a channel. It's five to 15, 15 to 25, 25, um, was it 25 to 50 and 50 to 100 and then the large ones, okay? So you're not counting cumulative. You're counting inside the channel. So if you were to look at, at, a, at a count like this, then in the chart, I'm sorry. <laughs> In the chart, it would look like this. Okay? And if you look at the, at the code 8 on the large ones, okay, look how far off that is, which could happen. 
How could that happen? Somebody could take a fluid sample bottle and sneeze at the time they're doing it, could have brushed some dirt into it, whatever. You, you don't know how. But this looked like a pretty clean fluid except for the large particles. And we said the large particles typically come from the outside in, right? So it, to me, that would look like somebody made a mistake in the fluid sample, right? But with NAS code or NAS code, you have to quote one number to the largest one of all the channels. Okay, and, and that's why, that's why this, this code is, is sometimes misleading. Okay. Now, this has been updated, okay, to the AS4059. It's still the same kind of thing, except you notice that the micron ranges now have a sub C on it. Okay, that's the only difference that they really have. And then, so the same sample, on this chart, okay, would still give you the class eight. We didn't solve any of the other problems with the NAS code. We just did this, and that would give you the same number to the AS4059. Now, what they also did when they rewrote the specification, okay, is they have the AS4059E2, which is a cumulative count, like the ice, like the ISO count. So you're counting, you know, greater than 4, 6, 14, 21, 38, or 70. So this gives you a lot of information. Okay, and it's expressed in, in quite a way, actually. It's a, it's expressed like a 10A. This one will be 10B, 10C, my, and then my finger will get tired. And so this would be how you, how you would express the AS4059 E2. Okay, there's a lot of information there, very similar to the, to the isocobitone. And recently they've, they've had a new update and they've taken away the letters. So it would just be a, a 10, 10, 11, 12, 11. Okay. So when we look at it, that fluid sample you have up there with the, with the NAS1638 and the S49E, it would be a 12 versus 12. And then when you compare an ISO 4406, a 2018 would look something like this, uh, when you're looking at the AS, uh, AS 4059E2. Okay. Now we'll have time for questions afterwards, but the, the rest of the presentation will talk about cleanliness and we'll express it as an ISO code. Okay. So all of this is kind of a, a precursor of having information so that when we look at target fluid or target cleanliness levels, I mean, this is, this is the big, the big point. Okay. If we've monitored and tested our fluid and we know where we are, how can we, how can we put how clean we want to be? Now I've gone into places before and I've asked people, you know, how clean do your fluid need to be? And they say, you know, Cam, I want it as clean as you can get it. And I'm like, do you really have the budget for that? You know, or they say, this is as clean as I can get it. And I'm like, okay, well, how important is it to you? So the, the way we do this, and this is, this, this way we do this is, is we have to take a look at systems and how they're being used differently. Okay. And the way is a Volkswagen bug you know, versus a, a Ferrari, the maintenance is different on them. The space shuttle is totally different than, you know, the machine you have bailing, you know, bailing cardboard in the back. So we have to take a look at not only how the system's built, the component sensitivity, but how it's used, the environment it's used in, and how important it is to the profit center. So this system that we're looking at is a weighting system. It was originally developed by the British Fluid Power Association, and, and we're using it with their permission. But this weighting system is not new. There's been, there's been a lot of different ones published over the years. This one I like a lot, or we like a lot, because it has a couple different channels in it that some of the other ones don't have. And really the, the biggest one to me is the environmental considerations, is what is your ingression rate possible? in the system. So how does this work? Well, we walk through these parameters and we put a weighting number on them. Now the sample I'm going to show you here is an excavator 
working in a rock quarry. Okay? So, the first one is operating pressure and duty cycle. So we look down there, we have, you know, light, medium, and heavy, severe duty. And then on the other ones, we have the pressure range of the components in the system. Okay? Now, when we're looking at light, medium, and duty, light, medium, heavy duty applications, we're looking at the transients or the pr pressure changes that you have through the cycling of the machine. Okay, in this case, we have a machine that's run at 3,000 PSI, and an excavator can go from idle or close to zero up to the full pressure range of the components, okay? So in this case, we're, we're looking at a number five, okay? When you're looking at severe, okay, those are things like rock crushers, uh, punch presses, you know, things that, that create a, a real a rock and rolling in the hydraulic fluid, okay? Uh, this one's a five. So we'll write that number down. Component sensitivity weighting. Um, how susceptible are the components to damage because of contaminant? You know, gear pumps, ram pumps, gear pumps, you know, gear pumps chew up dirt and spit them out. You know, they're not, they're not going to be damaged by many things. And then on the high end, you have, you know, piston pumps, servo valves, and the really high-performance servo valves. So in this case, you know, there's piston pumps and proportional controls in an excavator. So this one is a sub-4. Life expectancy weighting. This is what is the life expectancy of the piece of equipment. Now, I went to a manufacturing plant, and, and they had a, radi a hydraulic radial arm drill that was built before World War II in Poland. And they were still using that thing because it was a workhorse. That's not what we're talking here. We're talking about how many hours do you expect this piece of equipment to run before it has a major maintenance. I'm not talking about changing filters. I'm talking about shutting it down, taking it, taking the piece of equipment back to the garage, giving it a do-over. Okay? Now, this one you can debate with customers or debate with people a long time, whether the right number is 10,000 hours, whether it's 20,000 hours or 40, but for this case, we're going to use, we're going to use 20. Cost of component replacement. This one has cylinders and proportional valves. They're quite expensive, so that gives us a three. Downtime waiting. This is very important. How important is this piece of equipment to the profit center? Okay, and like I said before, you have a, you have a, like, say in a steel mill, because I used to run around those a lot. So, you know, automatic gauging system in a steel mill. Okay, that's the thing that goes through and it tells you whether the, whether the steel is the right thickness. That thing goes down, your mill goes down. You don't make any product. That's very important. And then you have a bale, like I said, the baler on the, back dock that bales cardboard before it goes to the garbage. That's not very important. You know, which one should be, should have, which one should be run cleaner to have less downtime? And I would say the one that has the most importance to your profit center. In this case, you know, an excavator, high production quarry, uh, four. Safety liability. Uh, how what are the chances of somebody getting hurt if the hydraulic system failed? Okay, in our industry, it's really quite small. You know, it, if you're looking at elevators, you're looking at rides at Disney or something, it, it could be higher. But typically, when a hydraulic system goes down in our equipment, what happens? System stops, right? So it, it's not really going to cause a safety issue to the operator. This doesn't take into account leakage or oil going on a you know, a golf course or something. And then the last one is environmental weighting. You know, clean areas to hostile areas. You know, are you in a lab environment or are you working outdoors? Now, the, the, to me, the, the thing is hostile. A lot of people think their places are hostile. You know, if, if you walk, if you don't have to wear a dust mask or you walk out and you blow your nose and it's not, you know, full of coal dust and stuff, it's not hostile. Most of the places where our hydraulic uh, units run are really, I would say, fair to poor. Um, in this case, 
you know, we're going to put it as a pour because it, it's outdoors. There's no, there's no filters on the air that go into the system. And before we add this up, we have to make the statement that regardless of what number that comes up here, we have to make sure that our fluid is running cleaner than what the manufacturer's warranty recommends. Otherwise, we're going to void the warranty. Now, if you think about it, you know, those warranty, these numbers that are, that are quoted by manufacturers, you know, are usually quite conservative. And, and what I mean by that is if you have brand, if you have brand X versus brand Y and brand X is saying that my fluid has to be this clean and brand Y is saying my, in order for mine to run, it has to be this clean. This guy could make a statement to the customer saying theirs isn't rugged enough. You need to buy mine. So these numbers are usually quite conservative. I, I've never run this process and had a target cleanliness level come out higher than what the manufacturer's recommendations are. Okay, as we work through the parameters, we're going to add up the numbers. And you have the first number is 18, which are all the parameters. And the last one is the environmental, is that gives you two numbers as a 21. And then you take that and you plot it against the chart with the with the line down the middle. So you come up with the 18 and you go over to the side. So the target cleanliness lum number that we've come up with that is a 161411. And in general terms, you would need a, a five to six micron filter that sees most of the fluid in order to achieve that. So that gives you a target, gives you a starting point. So now once you, you implement that filter or you make that change or whatever you're going to do to the system, it's really important that you monitor the fluid cleanliness on a regular basis in order to make sure that you're meeting the standards that you've just set for yourself and you're making good progress. It's very, it could very well happen that, that you put a five to six micron filter in there and you run it for a few hours or whatever, you find out you're not making any difference at all. Then you go back and you might have to make a change in your plan or make a change in your strategy to get there. And you might also say, hey, I'm, my fluid's clean. You know, I'm running at 16, 13, you know, 10. Well, what this is a life extension factor. And what this says, if you were to take clean oil, and it's, I'm sorry it's hard to see up there, but clean oil is generally somewhere around a 22, 19, 16 out of the barrel, unless you pay a lot of money for it to be filtered. If you take that to a 16, 13, 11, which is under code five, Okay, you could expect a life expectancy change in your in your hydraulic system components by five times. And even if your fluid is very very clean, if you can still make a a change to drop down one ISO code, and it's practical and within the budget, you can still change your life expectancy by by one or two times. Okay. Now, I have to apologize a little bit. When I first put this presentation together, I thought I was doing an, a, a 90 minute presentation. So we're coming to the end of the end of the hour and I wanted to make sure we get, we got through this part of the presentation. Um, when we're talking about contamination control products, I'll try, I'm going to, so what I'm saying is I'm going to speed up very quickly here. Um, We're looking at the reduction of solid particular um, contamination by using filters, okay? And when you're looking at filters, we have to look at the performance of the filter itself, the filter grade, what micron rating I'm looking at, where I'm going to put it, the sizing of it, okay? The filter accessories like indicators and that kind of thing I'm going to put on it. And if I'm going to compare two different or three different manufacturers to find the best one for me, then I have to understand what the filter testing are, what those are, so I can I can intelligently compare two brands or two different styles of filter or two different medias. Okay? So when we look at that, okay, what we're trying to get out of the filtration is we're trying to limit the contamination so we can extend our component life and, and the other thing is, is to enhance reliability. That's the big thing is that your reliability and to limit your downtime is where the payoff is 
from investing the time and energy and having a control plan, implementing that plan. And then we, the uh, safety of the operation is, is key. Okay, so when we're looking at at fluid uh, efficiency or, or f- the filter efficiency, we look at it's efficient. How efficient is it taking contaminants out of the fluid stream? How much dirt can it hold? You know, what's the pressure drop across it? Because pressure drop is a horsepower killer, right? Um, we need to know the bypass performance because we don't want dirty oil going through the bypass and into the components. And we want to make sure it's compatible with the temperature range, the fluid compatibility, and such of how we're operating it. So those are the things that you have to take into mind. Okay, so once you have your target cleanliness and you have your monitoring, okay, we put the filter in. Now, this is really important is that when you're looking at a mobile piece of equipment, you know, the engineers put the filter in. And sometimes you're trying to put, you know, a lot of stuff in a little little place. But if you're putting, a, a, let's say, a bypass filter or adding a filter to a piece of equipment, we get the, we get the luxury of looking at it and saying, where am I going to put it? Well, let's put it in a place where the maintenance guy can easily see it and know when it has to, has to be, uh, the element needs to be changed. And let's put it in a way that makes it easier for him to do it. And that way you have a better chance of having, having the people implement the strategy or to, or to change the filters when they need to. What are the different kinds of filters? You put a filter in a suction line, okay? Now there's other slides that go along with this, but I'm just gonna go through it. Suction line. Strainers, what are they there for? Strainers are there to keep rocks and boulders out of your pump, okay? They really don't have a lot of impact on the overall cleanliness level of fluid. We can do return line filters. Okay, return line filters can protect the reservoir from the generated contaminants that come out of the components and protect your, your, your source of fluid, the reservoir. They don't do a very good job of protecting individual components in your system. Pressure filters. Pressure filters you can put after your pump, so it protects your system from any contaminants that are in your reservoir. And not only that, but you can change and you can put pressure filters of different parts of the system to, like, protect a, um, a manifold block with servo valves on them differently than your, than your normal um, uh, circuit. Okay, Desic- offline filters. Those are filters that you put that usually have their own pump and motor on them. They can be bypassed also with a valve structure. So you take a little bit of fluid out of the reservoir, clean it, put it back in. You know, some people call this kidney loops, right? Desiccant and different kinds of air breathers. You know, those little screw-on air breathers are probably, you know, a 10 micron, 20 micron. You know, what would be different if we put a 3 micron filter on there and also ran the air through some kind of a drying material like a desiccant or some other membrane type filter to make sure that the air above our reservoir or above our oil in the reservoir is has the lowest relative humidity you possibly can. Okay? And then we're looking at transfer filters. When we're adding oil to the system, how are we doing it? Are we dumping a barrel that I said is typically dirtier than we want or are we filtering it in? And then water removal equipment. You know, what happens if you have a catastrophic failure and you have a water cooler, you know, put a dump a bunch of water in your hydraulic system? That can be very expensive to get out, but there's things called vacuum dehydrators and other kind of systems that you can hook up to do that very quickly. So these are the, these are the tools that we have in our arsenal in order to impact our, our contamination level. And depending on, on, on how clean we want to get, depending on the type of equipment, depends on what combination, which one of these or which combination of these we're going to implement in our strategy. Okay. Design factors, we have to make sure that the material compatibility is correct, the collapse pressure, the fatigue rating in the filter is correct. If your system's running at 3,000 PSI and you put a filter on there it's rated at 2,000 PSI, somebody's going to have a bad day soon, right? So we just have to make sure we know when we're sizing that. And, and that's why 
sometimes dealing with a, with an outside company like a hydraulic distributor or something like that is a good point now that you know where you need to go as far as your target cleanliness level is then you get a consultant from the outside who, 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 um, specializes in that, you know, to ask the questions and the size filters for you. Okay. Um, this is just a reminder. Um, different filter accessories, indicators, there's going to be electric or pop-up. How am I going to use them? Uh, what kind of ports do I need? Am I going to use a bypass or not a bypass? Um, porting arrangements, how am I going to plumb it in? That's all really important. And then when you're comparing filters and types, has the filter been tested to stand ISO standards? Okay, and there's there's a lot of them. There's more than just filter efficiency. There's, you know, collapse and burst resistant testing. Um, this one is a fabrication integrity. It's a bubble test. It's what we use to make sure that we're not damaging um, the filter media when we're when we're actually pleating the filter. Um, compatibility testing, um, end load testing. And I guess fatigue is, is very important. And then the, the last one is actually the multi-pass test. Okay. And that's where we get the actual efficiency of the filter and we get the clean element delta P for sizing and we get the dirt holding capacity, which gives us an indication of how long the filter will last. All right. Thank you very much.